Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. There are two ways of looking at Alcoholics Anonymous. To our friends seated here among us, Alcoholics Anonymous doubtless seems a huge and spectacular success. They may be thinking of us as a people who have won brilliant personal victory by fighting great odds. But every AA in this audience knows his friends give him too much credit that in actuality his recovery did not happen that way at all. Each in his heart knows that he became too weak to fight alone, that he had to confess his life had become unmanageable and therefore unbearable. He remembers how his power of will to conquer alcohol was crushed, how he finally saw he could never win through under his own strength. Nevertheless, he will tell you that this bitter admission, the hardest a human being can make, was the beginning of his new life, that new life of which this meeting is such a glowing and grateful testimony. Hence, no AA meeting can ever be a boast of personal victory. It is, instead, our humble demonstration of that saving grace which all of us have found in a simple reliance on a power greater than ourselves. But, our friends may object, Isn't this contrary to most human experience nowadays? Each of you quits the fight. You form into groups, then you help each other. Meanwhile, depending upon some higher power. We admit it works. We have seen the proof. Still, your philosophy doesn't entirely make sense. How can you win wars without fighting battles? Nowadays, when almost everybody feels he must fight, even to survive, here is the Society of Alcoholics Anonymous telling us, yes, proving to the whole world, that in their experience, they have found a new life, only by first admitting they could not personally control the old, let alone managing anything or anybody else. By what strange paradox, Has this new strength arisen out of your bygone weakness? Whence out of complete defeat comes your astounding transformation? Explain, if you can, the secret of this seeming contradiction, this divine paradox. These are the very natural questions of those who first observe us. Intuitively, our friends sense a mystery. Most of them feel they have seen a miracle. For so powerful has been the alcoholic obsession that all through the ages, few victims have ever survived. Now comes this wholesale liberation, thousands every month. Is this miracle of recovery due only to the fact that we alcoholics have gotten together, telling each other that we are sick, advising each other to fetch in more sufferers, and exhorting each other to be more honest and tolerant? Is that all there is to it? Have we only constructed one more psychological gadget, this time operated by the patient rather than the doctor? Few people who have taken a good look at AA believe this to be the full explanation. Some years ago, a prominent physician was asked to explain Alcoholics Anonymous to a group of his colleagues. Said he, when defining the invitation, These AAs have assembled many powerful psychological resources. Yet the sum total of these resources does not explain to me the results I have witnessed in days and weeks. I have seen unbelievable changes in their behavior and motivation. 
Changes in alcoholics which formerly, if at all possible, should have taken years at best. I can only say this. There is a power at work among these people for which I cannot account. I have to call it the X factor. Most AAs call it God. I have no scientific explanation for this mystery. Like our friend the doctor, any AA will also admit that he cannot fully explain the inner mystery of his own transformation. He can only tell the story of it as best he can, so that others may, if they wish, find their own freedom. Mine is a simple tale to tell. As with countless other thousands, who had gone before me down the left-hand path to alcohol oblivion, I came finally to the jumping-off place and could not turn back. It was midsummer, 1934. At a New York hospital for alcoholics, I was lying on one of those grim beds of physical and mental anguish we AAs know so well. I had been there before. But this time, it was different. This time, I had no hope. This was the penance, the curtain, it seemed to me. What a devastating blow to my pride. I, who had thought so well of myself and my ability, of my capacity to surmount objects, was cornered at last. So I was soon to plunge out into the dark, joining that endless procession who had gone on before. I thought of my poor wife. There had been much happiness after all. What would I not give to make amends? But that was over now. No words can tell of the loneliness and bitter despair I found in that morass of self pity. Quicksand stretched around me in all directions. I had met my match. Alcohol was my master. Tense and anxious, my wife Lois sat downstairs with a staff physician. That kindly man, Dr. William Silkworth, a medical saint if ever there was was trying in his gentle way to explain my alcoholic dilemma to her. But, doctor, she pleaded, tell me, don't spare my feelings. Tell me truly, just why can't Bill stop? He has desperately wanted to for these several years. About other things, he always had great willpower and perseverance. He well knows that alcohol means ruin. Oh, tell me the truth. Why can't you stop? As considerately as he could, the good man explained how my drinking, once but a habit, had now become a veritable obsession. How my body, which could once tolerate alcohol, had now become highly sensitized to it. Allergic, he called it. So my dilemma was twofold. An obsession as powerful as that of a kleptomaniac to steal, and a physical intolerance to alcohol as grim as that of a diabetic to sugar. The obsession condemned me to drink in spite of myself. My bodily intolerance ensured that I would die or go mad if I kept it up. My only hope, therefore, was the expulsion of my self-destructive obsession, a rare occurrence once it had taken firm hold. At first the doctor had felt that I might be one of those rare exceptions, but now, seemingly, I was too far gone. I would, he thought have to be confined somewhere if I were to live very long. Such was my sentence. 
though not told me in so many words, I, I well knew what it was. I had tried too many times and had failed too often. I had no more strength to resist. I was through. But it was darkest before dawn. For then came a friend with a message. He was an alcoholic who had been relieved of his obsession. He stood before me as living proof of what he had to say. One alcoholic talking to another. He could convince where others could not. Despite my reluctance, for I was an agnostic, I knew I must heed his message or die. Though not easy to take, his message was simple and direct in the extreme. But within its seeming simplicity, it did carry the miraculous power to expel my alcohol obsession and catapult me into a new world. In my case, this occurred the very moment I was willing to lay aside my prejudice, admit my personal helplessness, and try without reservation what he offered me. Perhaps this is not the time or place to talk at length of my own recovery, of our AA program in detail, or of our astounding growth. This room is filled with fellow alcoholics who know and practice the AA way of life as well as I. The accomplishments of Alcoholics Anonymous are headlined in the press of the world. So I shall be content if I can remind myself and any who would hear that Alcoholics Anonymous is not, after all, a personal success story. It is, instead, the story of our colossal human failure, now converted into the happiest kind of usefulness by that divine alchemist, the living grace of God. For all those who would know us a little better, or who perchance might wish to try our simple message for themselves, I can do no better than leave with them the last seven lines of our book of experience, Alcoholics Anonymous. These lines read as follows. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your fault to him and your fellow. Clear away the wreckage of the past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall, we shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet more of us as you trudge our road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you. Until then. Where we have a very special guest today, Lois W. I'm going to ask Jack Go ahead. <laughs> Lois will be introduced after our luncheon and will say a few words, or a lot of privilege of doing whatever she wants to. At this time, I'm going to ask Jack Kay to come up and give us an invocation. I'm going to uh, tell y'all that he is the husband of the great al speaker y'all heard this morning. <laughs> come on, Jack. May we bow our heads, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the joy and happiness that's in this room today. We thank you so much for the blessings that each and every one of us are, are sharing through your grace. We thank you so much for bringing Lois with us, to us today and for having her share this meal which we're about to receive. We thank you so much for the, each and every miracle that's in this room now and those at the round that are not able to get here this morning. We ask that you please bless this food you're about to receive, and especially those that are prepared to continue to share in your grace through Christ our Lord. Has everyone been served their dessert? While you're finishing up your dessert, I'm going to start some introductions. 
I am Mark and I'm an al -Anon. And if you're wondering how I got this job, I appointed myself. <laughs> so all good things come to he who waits, or she. <laughs> she. I'm going to ask Pam W. to stand and be recognized. She was our Thursday night early bird speaker. Jackie M., who was our Friday night speaker, she kicked off the round up. <laughs> Mose Y., who will be our speaker tonight, and his lovely wife, Mary. <laughs> and Lynn W., who will be our speaker in the morning. <laughs> and now I'm going to start at the head table. On my far right is Dorothy K. She is the al -Anon Hospitality Chairman for the Roundup. <laughs> Dot does a fantastic job. Ruth, who is our al -Anon Delegate from the state of Georgia. <laughs> Dorothy, who is our al -Anon State Delegate, no, I don't mean to say Delegate, Chairman. She was Delegate and now is Chairman. And Carol Kay, who was our al -Anon speaker this morning. <laughs> and now comes the piece de resistance. I feel very honored to have the privilege to stand here and introduce to y'all Lois W., who is going to... <laughs> Carol will help Lois stand to the podium, and she will lay a few good words on us. Hi, everybody. Hi. <clears throat> it's just wonderful to be here with you all, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate all your love and devotion to al -Anon and to AA, and to each other, and to me. It is um, that love and devotion, I think, that um, makes AA and al -Anon and al -Anon, our three big A's, the great power that it is. And um, I really believe it's a, a world-shaking power. The future of our fellowships, I think, is going to be very, very, very great and very portentous. So I thank you all for what you are doing. And I want to say a little bit about your um, interest in, in me as an early member and how much I uh, love you and appreciate you for that. But I also want you to know that I realize that anybody can start something, but it has to be carried on. And you links in the chain that are carrying it on are just as important factors as the persons who started at the beginning. And, well, I guess that's the end of that <laughs> subject, except that um, Bill was very, 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 um, well, I might almost say afraid of personalities being made too much of in AA because um, he had seen so many, so many societies and <clears throat> associations that had been really ruined by the, not necessarily the devotion, but the uh, prejudice feelings about the, their leaders. So in AA and Al-Anon and Al-Anon, 
we're all leaders. We all lead somebody else, help to lead somebody else onto the path that is going to be in our end of one of the three fellowships. So maybe I'll just say a few words about how this um, great fellowship started. Way back in the very early days of this century, Bill and I were married, but before that, of course, we had to become engaged. And I was very, very proud of him because <clears throat> he would go with the boys to the bars and saloons, they called them in those days, and he'd order root beer or ginger ale or something of the sort, sarsaparilla perhaps, <laughs> while the boys had their more alcoholic drinks. And I thought he had such great willpower, showed such strength of character that he refused to drink with the boys. And then in 1918, we were married. And he, it was during the First World War. And he was stationed in New Bedford, Massachusetts. And New Bedford was a cotton town, and there was quite a lot of money there, and, and uh, social gatherings, and the uh, <clears throat> the society matrons, the men were almost all in the army, so it was the matrons that did most of the society entertaining. They would ask the men at the post to their various affairs. And... <clears throat> When I arrived there, after being married, we were married a little early because then we had planned, because Bill, we had, there were rumors of Bill's uh, uh, <clears throat> unit being sent overseas. So we went, I went to New Bedford, Massachusetts, and went and started going to some of these social gatherings with him. And when, at the first one, when I started to go home, <clears throat> when it was time to leave, I couldn't find Bill. No sign of him anywhere. And um, I asked around, and they, some of the boys said, oh, we had to take him home. He was so drunk. And of course, I was flabbergasted because I hadn't known that he was taking any liquor. And when I got home, there he was, laying in bed, and the boys had put a pail on his head in his bed. So, that was my first introduction to his drinking. But I didn't worry about it too much, because I was quite shocked. But I felt quite positive that living with me would be such an inspiration. <laughs> that he wouldn't need the artificial stimulant of alcohol. <laughs> but as the years went by, and I tried with all my heart and soul to help him to stop drinking, his drinking got worse and worse and worse and worse until he was, did nothing else, was good for nothing, whatever, but drink. I had to make all the decisions. I had to learn the, earn the livelihood. I had to be the head of the family. Bill was just a sot. <laughs> but all these Many years as he had been drinking, I had always hoped and <clears throat> really felt quite sure that because he was such a fine man, such a wonderful person, 
that he must, he surely would get over this terrible habit. Towards the end, he had asked me to help him. Before that, he had felt he could stop whenever he wanted to. And he used to write in the Bible. Well, this is after he found out he couldn't stop, but he used to write in the Bible to my beloved wife, I promise you this day, never to take another drink. He was doing the most sacred and binding thing that he knew how to do. And at the end then, during these last few years, he wanted with all his heart and soul to stop drinking, and he couldn't. And of course, he was a very, very beaten and saddened human being. But somehow, I don't know, this, although at the moment I would lose hope, but there always was a tiny little bit of hope that somehow, some way, he would get sober. And then, as you all have read about, I'm sure, the big book, he had this wonderful, illuminating experience. And he was sober for the rest of his life. And one look at him, I knew I never, I never had a doubt that his whole life has changed. He was a completely changed man. Of, and I, of course, I was extremely, extremely grateful. This is the most wonderful thing what I had been working for all my life. And I had been sure that I could I could change him. I was sure from the very beginning. But of course, as time went on, and I didn't, I had to recognize the fact that I was doing a relationship. And in those last years, we saw nobody no family, no friends. We lived completely unto ourselves. I, of course, as I said, I had to go to work. <clears throat> and I'd come home and Bill had, all he did was go out and get his liquor and stay home and drink. Well, after this wonderful, wonderful experience that he had, as I say, I knew knew that that he was sober for life. And I was very, very happy. But Bill had an idea. He thought if he could get sober, so could others. And he set about trying to help other people to get sober also. And he'd go to the highways, the byways, and pull the people home to our house. And we had the house. We lived in my father's house in Brooklyn, New York. And there were five stories. And we had drugs on every floor. <laughs> but very few got sober. And Bill learned from Dr. Silkways, his wonderful doctor at the hospital where he had to go three or four times. He learned that that he was really talking down to them. He he was a he he like me was going to cure them. And um, he was telling them what to do and how to do it. And they had to have an experience exactly like his. And um, Nobody did. So nobody got sober at first. And then he met Dr. Bob. And from there now, I guess you all know the story. But my side of it was that 
one one day I woke up to myself. And that day was the day that Bill said to me, Now hurry up, Lois, let's get ready and go to the meeting. We went to the Oxford group meetings in those days, which was a was a society that Bill's friend who came to him with a message belonged to. And he said, Let's get ready, let's hurry up and get ready and go. And I had a shoe in my hand. And I took that shoe and I threw it as hard as I could and said, Damn your old meetings. <laughs> well, I wasn't used to saying damn or swearing. <laughs> and it shocked me that I lost my temper at such an innocent little remark that he made. Why had I done it? I began to think about it. All this time, for all these years, I had taken myself for granted. I had thought because I'd had a good religious sound, moral bringing up, and a happy childhood life, I had thought that I must be right, that I must have the answer. And it never occurred to me to question myself. So after the shoe-throwing episode, I began to analyze myself a little bit to think, why had I done this? Why had I reacted so violently at such a simple remark? And I realized that before this, I had been a very needed and important person in the family. But now Bill was sober, he had all his other friends. He didn't need me anymore. And I didn't know just what I was supposed to be doing. I didn't know where I fitted in the picture, just like, I can't think of your name. <laughs> just as Carol was saying this morning, that she didn't, <laughs> didn't fit in. I still couldn't. That shows my embarrassment when I can't think of a name like that. Anyway, I couldn't see where I fitted in. And... Uh, I was really um, lonely, deeply, far more lonely after Bill sobered up than because, than before I had, because Bill and I both needed each other. And although he, he was drinking a lot of the time, most of the time during the years, yet we had wonderful times together. We had a most full and interesting life before <clears throat> he got so mad that he couldn't do anything else but drink. So, um, as I say, I began to think about myself and realize that I was full of resentment at all these new friends, that my feelings were terribly hurt, that I wasn't, that he didn't need me anymore. I felt as if I'd been put on the shelf. And... It took me a long, long time to work this all out. It didn't come all of a sudden. It took many, many months for me to figure it all out. So I finally realized that I needed this way of life, this program, just as much as building. That even though my own religion was good and moral and was everything about it, was perfectly all right, yet it wasn't good enough. It was like the saying, the good is often the enemy of the best. So I decided that I should live these, live by these 12 steps that Bill was living by. And Annie Smith and Akron had come to the same conclusion. And in those early days, there was no literature in it. Even after Bill sobered up, there was, for a long time, there was no literature. And if you wanted to help a group get started, you had to go. You had to be there. You had to travel there. So we used to travel around the country a lot. And... Um, while Bill was talking to the alcoholics, I would tell the story of the shoe-throwing episode.
to the families of the alcoholics. And Annie Smith did the same, and then the, as it began to get more and more people, the families, the wives often told the others about how they had found that they had to live by the 12 steps too. So there got to be a, a in various towns, groups of the families of alcoholics. Then to go along and skip quite fast, the, um, in 1950, or 49 and 50, Bill went around the country to try and see how the members in AA, which had grown really very, very much in those days, um, how they felt about having a, a conference of delegates to supervise the management of AA. And um, when he went all around the country, he'd find these groups of the families of alcoholics. They weren't um, anything specially organized. They weren't at all organized, in fact. But they were some places they just put up curtains and serve coffee and put up curtains in the clubhouses. They were, they were quite the style in those days. Every, every place had a clubhouse. And uh, they put up curtains in the clubhouse and serve coffee and, and do uh, the jobs, that kind of housekeeping jobs. But in other places, they would meet together for their own help and to try and help each other. So when he came back from this trip, he suggested that I start a fellowship and a, an office, a central office for a fellowship of the families of alcoholics. And so I did. And we wrote first to to uh, the AA office to see if they had any names of the families. And to our surprise, they had 87 families who had inquired of AA if they could join the AA fellowship. But the AA fellowship had nothing for the families. So they just put the names aside. But they were only too glad to hand us those 87 names. And I got a friend of mine to help him, help me, and Anne Bigger, the name was, and she and I wrote to these 87, and we got 50 answers, which was pretty good, we thought, a pretty good proportion. So Alamon really started with 50, 50 groups, and from there on, we have grown to this tremendous size and importance, which I really think it, our thought is, is uh, equally important with AA that it has today. So I want to again thank you all and tell you how I appreciate so much your carrying the message. And I hope that, and I feel very, very convinced and sure that our three A's are going to travel many, many generations into the future with a very great help in solving our great world problems. Thank you very much. y'all feel, but I've got goosebumps. And when I have goosebumps, that's good, because it means something's real great. It doesn't mean I'm cold, it means something's real great. I can't begin to express our appreciation. Carol accepted to be our Al-Anon speaker. 
And then Jack decided to come with her, and out of this evolved the invitation to Lois. And I think we owe a debt of gratitude to them, because had they not been coming, we might not have had Lois. Thank y'all all for being here, and I'm going to ask that y'all stand, and let's say the Lord's Prayer together. I think we have a lot to be grateful for. Join hands if you don't mind. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespass, give those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.